All right, so for this recording, we got a, a few different examples we're running through. The first of which is given this function of 1 over x squared minus 9, where we need to go through and find the critical numbers. So the way we're going to do that is first, well, ultimately, I need to take a first derivative. So first, I'm going to rewrite the function. I'm actually going to rewrite it where I'm bringing this x squared minus 9 currently as a power of 1 in the denominator up. I'm going to make that x squared minus 9 raised to a power of negative 1. Now if I take my first derivative, f prime of x would equal, using my chain rule, I'd bring down the negative 1 to the front. I'd have x squared minus 9. Subtract 1 away from that power I brought down. Power is now negative 2. And then take the derivative of the inside. Inside, you would have a derivative of 2x. Okay, if I rewrite this because of the negative exponent, notice how all of this is attached together through multiplication to that negative exponent expression. I can create a fraction out of this. And the way I rewrite the fraction is I take my negative exponent expression of x squared minus 9. I bump that down here to the bottom. New power is a positive 2. And the rest of the stuff, because I've basically moved this part of it, the rest of the stuff being the negative 1 and the 2x, I can multiply together and stick on top. So there is my simplified first derivative, which I can now apply in finding the critical numbers. So to find the critical numbers, what we do is we explore where the first derivative equals 0. And we explore where the first derivative does not exist. And as we find solutions over here, we're always aware of the original function and whether or not the values we're finding are actually in the domain of the original function. If they're not in the domain of the original function, then we cannot include them as critical numbers. So where the first derivative would equal 0, we're taking negative 2x, our numerator, we're setting that equal to 0 to solve. Obviously over here, x is going to equal 0. So potentially we have a critical number down here if we let c be our critical numbers, write a little therefore statement, potentially 0 is one of those critical numbers. As for the does not exist side, we're taking our denominator from our first derivative of x squared minus 9 as a quantity squared. We set that equal to 0. If we solve this for x, well, essentially we can take the square root of each side to get rid of that squared quantity, leaving us with x squared minus 9 equals 0. If we solve for x from there, x squared would equal 9. Take the square root of each side, x would be plus or minus 3. Plus or minus 3 would lead us to believe that those are also critical numbers, so we could insert those down here with our final answer. Now, the problem is, if you look at positive 3 or negative 3, and you plug back in here to the original function, what would happen if you square either of those values and then subtract on this 9, you'd end up with 0 in the denominator. And we can't divide by 0, so we cannot include plus or minus 3 as a critical number. Therefore, our only critical number on this problem would be 0. Okay, now if we look at a, a couple of other examples, we're going to incorporate this critical number idea into those examples. Next problem I want to look at, what we're doing here is we're looking for absolute extrema. To find the absolute extrema, again, start by finding the critical numbers. If you're going to find critical numbers, you've got to take the first derivative. So first derivative here would be 3x squared minus 12. That's it for the first derivative, already simplified and ready to go. So finding critical numbers, all we have to do here is explore where the uh, first derivative equals 0. So we take 3x squared minus 12. We set that equal to 0 to solve. The easiest thing to do here to solve would be factor out a 3. Have x squared minus 4 then as a remaining quantity equal to 0. That 3 we factored out does not have an x, so we can divide that out. As far as the x squared minus 4 equals 0 is concerned, if I swing the 4 over 
and take the square root of each side. Don't forget the plus or minus. Plus or minus 2 would be our critical numbers. So if we were establishing critical numbers here, we could say, therefore, C, our critical numbers are negative 2 and positive 2. And make sure you go back, look to see not only are they in the domain of the function, but in this case, are they on that interval which makes up the domain for our function, and both values are. Now to find the absolute extrema, all we do is we take our critical numbers that we found, and we also take the values that make up the endpoints for our interval, we plug those back into the original function. Since we're only looking for absolute extrema, this is the easiest way to do it. So if I go in order here, I'm going to take negative 3, my first endpoint, I'm going to plug in, I'm going to see what I get back for the function. Then I'm going to take negative 2, next value I found is a critical number, plug in. After that, we'll take 2, plug in, and then finally, our last endpoint of 5, take that, plug in. So again, if you take these values and you plug back into the original function, take note of the answers that you get back after plugging into the original function. To determine your absolute extrema, all you have to do is look for your lowest value you got back and your highest value that you got back and note those as your absolute extrema points. The lowest value that we got back at negative 15, this would be my absolute minimum value for this function, and that would occur where x is 2. Uh, when I got 66 back, that's the absolute max. That's the highest this function will go, and that occurred where x was 5. All right, for our final problem here on this little recording, this little series of three problems that we're doing, uh, what we're going to do now is we're going to go through and find where this function is increasing or decreasing and also find any relative extreme points. So as we've done on the previous two problems, we need to look at critical numbers. So take your derivative. Derivative here, pretty straightforward. It's going to be 4x minus 4x cubed. Where now, if we're trying to figure out what the critical numbers are, we set our derivative equal to 0. So 4x minus 4x cubed set equal to 0 and solve. Don't have to worry about does not exist here because there's no denominator present. Uh, if you factor out to solve this equation, a 4x, that would leave you with 1 minus x squared. We factored out something that has an x in it. So that x is significant. We would have a solution of 0 from that x factor. And the 1 minus x squared, well, if we work that out real quickly over here, the easiest thing to do is swing that x squared over, take your square root of each side. Don't forget that it's going to be plus or minus when you take the square root. Plus or minus 1 uh, would also be solutions here for where the derivative equals 0. So if we're establishing critical numbers, we'd say C for critical numbers equals negative 1, 0, and 1. Now if we're using those to help us find where it's increasing or decreasing for this function and also to find any extreme points, we can set up a chart. Let me switch slides here. I have an x column, a derivative column, a function column, and then a column devoted to specific extrema points. As we get started in the first column, we'll start at negative infinity. We'll work our way up to the uh, smaller the critical numbers we found, which was negative 1. We'll pause at negative 1, then go from negative 1 on up to 0. Pause at 0. Go from 0 up to 1. Pause at 1 and then take 1 on up to infinity. In noting what's going on with the first derivative, at least with respect to the uh, critical numbers we found, for negative 1, 0, and 1, we know the first derivative is 0 for all of those, because after all, the derivative had to equal 0 to come up with those in the first place. Now looking at our intervals, well, if we pick numbers on these intervals, 
and we plug back into our first derivative, we need to take note of the kinds of signs that we're getting back. So if I start with this first interval, I take negative infinity to negative 1, something like negative 2, that would be less than negative 1. Plug back into the first derivative. So plugging back in right here. If I take negative 1 and I plug back in, now let's see, that's going to give me negative 4 minus 4 times a negative 1 cubed. Uh, that would end up being positive, excuse me. All right, that's my mistake. We're taking negative 2. I'm sorry, we're plugging in negative 2. So if I take negative 2 and plug in, that's going to give me negative 8 minus 4 times a negative 2 being cubed. It's still going to be negative. Looks like we're going to end up with a positive value that we're getting back. So for this first interval, we should get something positive. Now, since we're dealing with a polynomial function originally, we should end up with a little rotation here for the first derivative column. But I'd encourage you to go back, pick numbers on each interval, plug that back into the first derivative just to verify we are getting those signs back. Assuming these signs are true, we can conclude that the original function is increasing on the interval from negative infinity to negative 1, since we got a positive result back for the first derivative. It's decreasing on the interval from negative 1 to 0, since we got a negative result back for the first derivative. It's increasing here for 0 to 1, and it's decreasing here for 1 to infinity. Now, in terms of extreme points, we will have some extreme points. As we line up our extreme points with the original critical values, or sorry, critical numbers that we found, we'll notice that we have changes in direction for each of these points. So if I get this set up, we'll have a change in direction at 1, a change in direction at 0, a change in direction at negative 1. Since the graph is going from up to down around this point. Well, if it goes up and then back down, we're talking about some sort of relative maximum. We go from down to up around this point. That would be a relative minimum. And then we go up again, down again. That would be another relative maximum. Only thing we have to do at this point now is take our x values, plug back into the original function to figure out the corresponding y values at each point. So those would be our point values after plugging back into the original function.